let's go, I guess, uh, with uh, socialist democracy in the GDR. A nice picture that you have where it says, das muss man wissen, what translates to that, you gotta know. So I guess uh, that's what I want to uh, transfer to you now, something that uh, you gotta know. Okay, so uh, democracy uh, is the main field of anti-GDR propaganda. It is probably also true for the socialist countries in the whole, as a whole, but uh, the leading capitalist countries, the academic elites and media outlets, they do not grow tired to remember everyone about the authoritarian character of the socialist countries. The GDR is labeled one-party dictatorship, state of surveillance and injustice. We came to a point, actually, where it is totally normal to teach in schools about the two German dictatorships, namely fascism and the GDR. And there's a reason why the capitalist state States do in fact need to see socialism as authoritarian and dicta uh, dictatorial. They cannot accept state or public ownership in the economy. Capitalism is, in, is essentially built on the idea of private ownership and liberalism as its ideological and philosophical concept. The other way around, democracy and the concept of bourgeois democracy effectively and primarily means the right of private property. Anything else is suppression. In fact, states that are not socialists, socialists, but also limit the space for free market and private ownership are easily labeled authoritarian. Western capital cannot profit the way they want to. This, by the way, should be kept in mind when looking at uprisings in Hungary and Prague in the 50s and 60s. They were, that's what we are told, uprisings for democracy. What they mean and what they effectively also were, from my point of view, are movements for bourgeois democracy. But that's a special topic that we maybe, at least not now, can dive into. So before talking about the socialist democratic, uh, uh, socialist democratic system of the GDR, as an example for the socialist camp, we need to be clear that the scale to measure democracy is fundamentally different from the point of view of bourgeois standpoint to a proletarian standpoint. The GDR never wanted to be a bourgeois constitutional state. It was, if you wanted to use that term, on the way to become a, so, uh, become a socialist constitutional state. Shortly, I also here want to uh, add the development of Marxist understanding of the political form of socialism with the help of short quotes from Marx, Engels, and Lenin, just to set a proper ground to discuss the system of the GDR. Uh, it's in the Communist Manifesto that Marx and Engels write, we have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariats to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. Proletariat needs to become ruling class as a requirement for democracy, no doubt that the socialist state will be a democratic order for Marx and Engels. The very main and first acts to democratize society lay in the socialization of the means of production. Um, the ideas of Marx and Engels towards the political system of socialism sharpen in the impression of the Par Paris Commune very much, the pressed uh, proletarian order. In the Civil War in France, they write, but the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. The bourgeois state brought up functionalities, a structure that is able to fulfill its needs, changing the purpose of the state. Its program also makes it necessary to change the structure, which usually also, usually also means changing personnel, etc. <laughs> In the critique of the Gotha program, Marx very clearly points out the following. Between capitalist and communist society, there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one into the other. Corresponding to this also uh, is a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletari proletariat. And to this, I want to add a quote from Lenin. He gave 1919, just after the October Revolution. This means replacing democracy for the rich by democracy for the poor. This means replacing freedom of assembly and the press for the minority 
for the exploiters, by freedom of assembly and the press for the majority of the population, for the working people. So, dictatorship of the proletariat means democracy for the many, the working class and its allies, and dictatorship for the few. Whereas capitalist democracy means effectively democracy for the few and dictatorship for the many. But uh, why we need di dictatorship, why should uh, you need dictatorship for the few at all in the socialist uh, system? Also uh, a quote from Lenin, 1920. The proletariat's conquest of political power does not put a stop to its class struggle against the bourgeoisie. On the contrary, it renders the, the struggle most widespread intense and ruthless. So the rulers and favorers of capitalism will not be content with the political victory of socialist power in any place of the world. The Soviet Union was in constant threat right away after the October Revolution. This is very much proven by the developments of the last century and until this day, looking at Cuba, for example. Uh, so the most powerful, powerful capitalist countries will do anything to roll back this change in power, which actually was also the name for the strategy, the rollback. So, um, okay, I think I'll shorten here a little bit and uh, go on also here with theses on the uh, uh, yeah, democratic structure of the GDR. Um, the GDR was a democratic society and it developed forms of socialist democracy. The socialist property relations, the political programmatic principles of the GDR, and also its concrete form indicate a qualitatively higher form of democracy which cannot exist in bourgeois capitalist societies. The political system was based on the interests of the broad mass of the population. Restrictions of democracy have to be analyzed and discussed concretely in the historical context, especially in the international class struggle and the Cold War uh, they are yeah, crucial frameworks to understand this. It's uh, pretty much the same thing I also talked about uh, the economic system. It's just, again, the general mindset that we need to establish uh, looking at the development of socialist countries. And the deepening of the democratic relations, the open and self-critical discussions had uh, all kinds of shortcomings, which created increasing problems, especially in the 80s. I'll get to that a little bit. And again, also here, I'll go a little bit faster through that because I guess we all know it already, but uh, some uh, starting points that Franti already mentioned yesterday, at least some of them that I want to stress. There were no Soviets, councils, or committees to defend the revolution that we have in Cuba, for example, um, until, uh, until today, actually, also. Um, in Eastern Germany. We did not have this kind of revolutionary democratic structures. We did actually German, uh, the November Revolution uh, in 1918 and 1919. They actually established, established these soldier and worker councils um, in Germany. But after 1945, we did not have these kinds of structures. So there was an anti-fascist uh, resistance, of course, in Germany, but it was relatively small. And the political consciousness of the population was massively influenced by 12 years of fascism. Uh, of, although, of course, there was a great longing for, for peace. Um, the period from 45 to 94, the founding of the GDR, developed a framework, a basis on which the democratic system of the GDR later developed on. So the unification of the communists and social democrats inside the Socialist Unity Party played a significant role since it created a huge and strong organizational base for the working class, but also the founding and admission of other parties and mass organizations, such the, uh, as the Free German U uh, Trades Union Federation and the Free German Youth, set the ground for further developments and the specifics of the political environment in the GDR. The land reform uh, and expropriation of Nazis were meant a huge democratization of the whole uh, rural uh, area of the GDR. Um, and the constitution of uh, 1949, which uh, was called an anti-fascist and democratic constitution, was agreed on after broad public discussions. So there was also uh, yeah, a democratic debate on this. All right. Um, going on from this, I want to also establish some of the like general mechanisms uh, of GDR democracy. Um, 
We will start with a quote from Walter Ulbricht, who was, as I already said, the leading political figure of the GDR in the 50s and 60s. Oh, I'm not there yet. Why, where's the quote? Okay, I guess you have to listen to it. <laughs> um, at this, oh no, I did change that. I will, I will not tell the quote. <laughs> It's it's not so important. We'll we'll get to the uh, get to the point. But the like the fender, fundament of the democratic character of the DDR lays in its uh, programmatic stance. First of all, it cannot be understood only by looking at the structure and the form of democracy. However, of course, it uh, did the form also reflect the political idea of uh, socialism. The ever better fulfillment of the needs of the people was the purpose of the social and economic development of the society. So this program was only to be executed on the base of people's ownership of the means of production. The main idea was that each and every person in the GDR was in one way or another involved inside the democratic structures of the society. Mm -hmm. Through mass organizations or parties, they were involved in the discussions and the process of decision making. Inside the democratic organs, such as the parliament, all the different groups of the population and regions of the country were represented. Democratic structures reached out to the very di direct living environment of the people, in the workplace and the neighborhoods. So now I want to establish some of the main uh, organizations that were involved in the system. and. Um, we already have learned about the Free German Trade Union uh, Federation that in the end had 98% uh, of all workers organized, which meant about 9.6 million members. Um, and um, because we have already talked about it, I go to the next, to the uh, Peasants Mutual Aid Association that was developed on the ground of the commissions of the land reform that organized the division of land after 1945. And this peasant association was at the forefront uh, to democratize the rural area in the east of Germany. We had the Democratic Women's League of Germany, which was formed in 1947. Its West German counterpart actually was banned in 1957, uh, just after also they banned the Communist Party of Germany, actually, in 1956, and also the Free German Youth uh, was also banned in West Germany. So they really were... Uh, quite restrictive in this time under Adenauer. Uh, the Democratic Women's League emerged from anti-fascist uh, women committees and uh, organized, for example, training courses and advocated the struggle for women liberation. We had the uh, groups for uh, of the Free German Youth um, that were already uh, set up in exile during fascism, especially in Great Britain they existed. And they were members of the World Federation of Democratic Youth uh, that's also existing until today, this organization. And they are the ones organizing this um, Weltfestspiele. World Festival. World, youth <laughs> and fe World Festival, Festival for the Youth, youth and, and students. students, I think it's called yeah. in English. All right. Um, yeah, it was uh, normal to become a member of the Free German Youth uh, as a teenager in the GDR. However, it was voluntarily. And it did play a big role for the cultural and political life of the youth and was very much involved uh, in the field of international solidarity also. Uh, last but not least, we had the Cultural Association of the GDR, which was a plural and non-partisan uh, gathering movement for intellectual interested uh, people of all kinds on the basis of anti-fascism and humanism. And uh, many writers of the GDR were members of this association. There are many, more, many, many uh, more organizations in the GDR that are also relevant, um, but uh, these are especially relevant talking about the democratic structure. But um, first of all, we should reflect on why this is actually special or what does it tell us. Um, I think we need to understand that firstly, that these organizations were deeply connected and intertwined with all the different structures of the society. You do have unions and cultural organizations, maybe also women organizations in capitalism, but there you had one organization for women, for the workers, for the youth. It was not a hobby organization, 
but very a very political one. The women organization was supposed to be the, the active voice for every woman in the GDR. It also, I also want to stress that uh, it is not by accident that it is youth, peasants, workers, women, and cultural organization. In the, in the GDR, you did not find lobby groups, interest groups for the rich people, for the elites. The idea was to involve the broad population, reach out to every sector of society, and elevate the interests of these named groups. All right. Uh, coming to political parties, because many people don't know that there were more parties than the Socialist Unity Party in the GDR, but there were. There were five different parties that existed in the GDR. The Socialist Unity Party, of course, as uh, I already talked, that was formed in uh, uh, 1946, and already then it was a huge party with more than 1.5 million members. It grew up to be uh, over 2 million members uh, until the end of the GDR, where it was uh, until then the leading political party. It has it had base organizations in enterprises as well as in residential areas, and the discussions and uh, decisions of the party, of course, uh, had a big impact on the other areas of the political system. Uh, though we need to understand that the uh, SED, uh, was also not a um, like monolithic block, that there were many also fierce discussions uh, that take, took place um, over the time. We have the Democratic Peasants Party of Germany, which was formed in 1948 to have a space for peasants to politically organize. They played a big role in the rural areas, of course, in the GDR, <laughs> often were the ones that deployed the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, especially were uh, played an uh, important role for the movement to build cooperatives. We had the Christian Democratic Party. As you know, that uh, party still exists in Germany. Um, this one was especially the eastern part of this uh, party. After 1945, it was formed in all occupied zones. Um, and um, yeah, in the, in the GDR, it had its own newspapers and different party units on regional and local levels. And Angela Merkel also was a member of this Christian Democratic Union, as well as the Free German Youth, by the way. She also was a member there. We have the Liberal Democratic Party of Germany, uh, which also was founded in 1945. Later, it grew to have more than 200,000 uh, members. During the first years uh, after the war, it was strictly opposed to any expropriation and demanded the right to private property. But after the foundation of the GDR, they accepted the direction that the GDR took and was integrated in all different levels of the democratic system. And last but not least, we had the National Democratic Party of Germany, which was formed also in 1948. It was formed to have a political space for those who were formerly in the area of influence of the Nazi party, but of course were not responsible for crimes of the fascist regime and were not active um, on a responsible level. Its orientation was clearly anti-fascist and democratic, and um, many of its members were routinees uh, of the war and came rather from the middle class, so to say. All these five parties were unified in the so-called democratic bloc. The leadership of the communist force was secured already in 1949 by the big influence that it uh, had all over the society. The democratic bloc was supposed to build an alliance with all political forces and integrate them in the socialist system. Mm -hmm. This created a legal space and a space for political discourse that was uh, unable in the GDR with all kinds of political forces. So the room for potential political enemies of socialism was uh, already then uh, diminished. Um, all right. Now we know of uh, mass organization and political parties. We can understand some of the main bodies of the democratic system, which is the National Front and the People's Chamber. Um, the well, all five political parties and the presented mass organizations with additional ones were members of the um, National Front. Uh, the National Front prepared the electoral 
list for the People's Chamber, the Parliament of the GDR. And besides this, uh, it had many committees and uh, secondary uh, levels of action to reach out even to the residential areas of the GDR where they formed residential area committees. And in the whole National Front, uh, they had more than 17,000 committees and more than three, 300,000 voluntary active members. Um, every group and area of the society was to be represented in this structure. Every citizen of the GDR was involved in the discussion more or less active through any of these organizations. Um, the People's Chamber was uh, elected through the list that was developed in the National Front. It was secured that the above presented five mass organizations um, were also inside the People's Chamber and the so-called block parties. The set of seats was pretty constantly shared along the time of the GDR. For example, in 1981, the Socialist Unity Party had 127 seats and the other block parties each had 52 seats and the union had 68, the youth 40, the women 35 and the Cultural Association 22. There was a secured portion in the parliament reserved for women, youth, peasants and workers. Um, oh yeah, that's actually uh, the uh, People's Palace, the uh, Palace of the Republic that was built I'm not quite sure, in the 70s, I think. Mm. Uh, that I thought comes later, <laughs> <laughs> this slide. Wait, just one second, please. To be, oh, that's wrong. All right, okay. Oh, that's, that's good. Okay, so the Palace of the Republic was built in the 70s, and actually what's uh, interesting about it is that uh, it represents, in a way, reflects this uh, kind of uh, inter interconnectivity between the mass organizations uh, in different fields and the parliament that would not be, you would not see in the US or in Germany right now. You had the People's Chamber, the parliament, that was having its, its meeting right here, whereas you also had all kinds of cultural activities in the same building, uh, a great uh, big concert hall and for like, cultural events, but also restaurants and places for the youth uh, and so on. So it actually was, was a place to represent the kind of new quality also of this democratic uh, relation that was set up in the GDR. Um, it was bulldozed down after 1990. I don't know when exactly. And actually, at the same spot where it was, they built up the old... They rebuilt the castle. The castle, yeah. That belonged to the kings before. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can see what kind of state we're living in right now. Okay. Um, coming to the political system of the GDR, not to scare you with another diff difficult chart, um, but just to give an uh, idea of how the system actually worked. So the People's Chamber is the legislative organ of the GDR um, that we have right in the middle. And um, it was elected for five years. It meets two to four times a year. Its session uh, sessions always were open for the public. Um, members of the People's Chamber and of local parliament had to obtain the approval of their working collective before running for office. And they had to give an account of their parliamentary work to the collective. In the event of significant short shortcomings, every deputy was subject to recall. Central state organs also regularly gave accounts to the People's uh, Chamber. The People's Chamber uh, elects uh, then the State Council, which func functions as a collective president uh, of the GDR, and also the Council of uh, Ministers, um, which is the government of the GDR with all the minist ministries inside. The strongest faction in the People's Chamber nominated the chairman of the State Council and the Council of Ministers, and laws could be proposed by the government and are voted by the parliament. There also is a possibility of referendums mandated by the People's Chamber, 
And um, yeah, we, we come to one example at least of a referendum later. So to again sum up the democratic mechanisms um, of the GDR, we will hear out what the State Council said in 1961. In the People's Chamber, the local people's deputies, their standing commissions and activates in production consultations in, in the factories and production cooperatives, in the socialist brigades, in the socialist work communities, and through participation in the committees and house committees of the National Front of, the Democrat of Democratic Germany, in the trade unions, the advisory councils of the agricultural cooperatives, parents' advisory councils, and other democratic institutions, citizens take an active part in planning and leadership in all areas of political, economic, and cultural life. So you can already see that there are many more structures in the overall democratic system of the GDR that we have not touched on. Uh, and also, for me, you will always learn new structures uh, along the way dealing with the GDR. Um, yeah, but this, is, I think, gives a good idea of the general intention and idea of the democratic structure. And to give you an idea of who sat in the People's Chamber, I uh, looked uh, up the... A division from 1981, which were 47% blue collar workers, 10.4% peasants, 70% uh, white collar workers, 23 intelligentsia, and 1% others. So it's not your typical lawyers and, I don't know, other people who usually sit in parliament right now, at least in for Germany. I'm not quite sure here. <laughs> um, yeah, you also had uh, under the central level of the government. Uh, the political structure, of course, existed in regional and communal uh, areas. There were 14 different regions in the GDR. Um, it was not a federal system, but a coherent uh, political structure. Um, right. Um, I will now come to... Okay, uh, wait, wait, wait. Before you go to the examples, because I know we've come now to three very mm -hmm. concrete examples, mm -hmm. but I do think that it is interesting. Um, this is my favorite slide of the presentation because I think it's so... Um, it is, again, interesting to show who sits in the people's chamber first. Like, that is an interesting statistic because it is different from here. And then also to just sum up one more time, maybe the question that you had raised earlier about how to get involved. Again, like, I think that the integration of, the integration of actually being active and being part of this process, it is almost difficult not to be. So it is... Uh, it seems so integrated through the mass organizations, through all the interest groups that are not interest groups, but just citizens of the country, um, that I think it, it, uh, it, shows very, it shows very nicely how much this differs from the general um, problems that we often face in society now, where this seems like a very removed process. And where even the, you get to vote all the time on something, doesn't actually make up for feeling that, oh, yeah, yeah, vote for this person, vote for that person. In the end, I don't know, either they build a coalition, this happens in Germany a lot, and then they do whatever they want anyways. So these types of, um, yeah, so it, I, I think it's very interesting to see how, how fundamentally different that uh, system functions. And especially for, um, I don't know, especially for groups that are active, that are struggling very, very hard for equality and being heard, for young people to be heard, for women to be heard in society, for rural and peasants to be heard, that there are these mechanisms that they are securely in there and represented, um, I think is pretty awesome. So I, yeah. So before you go into the examples, I think that needs to be drawn out. We can come to the contradictions and problems later, but for now we should like look at that. <laughs> all right. Go on. All right. All right. Um, yeah, I want to give uh, three concrete examples that actually I think, uh, yeah, uh, give give a good round impression of uh, the actual uh, democratic culture also that was established. I want to start with the so-called socialist constitution. I also already mentioned that there was a constitution um, voted on in, in 1949, and, and this was the well replaced this constitution in 1968, and because in 1949 the GDR did not already take the path towards socialism, it was called an anti-fascist uh, constitution. This one was called a socialist constitution. 
And actually, in the pretext of concluding this constitution, there was a broad public debate on the content of the constitution and the population from the 31st, uh, well, in there were yeah, some months, uh, more than 12,000 proposals that were submitted to the draft and the public discussions in the end led to 118 amendments uh, in the referendum uh, that um, took place. Um, it was an approval rate of 94.49% with a turnout of 98% of all voters. And it is an example for the kind of democratic process that grew to be more and more normal for the GDR. Uh, Walter Ulbricht makes this point quite clear. It has become com commonplace for us that the projects of lo our laws and resolutions are elaborated with the participation of a large number of scientists and specialists, as well as other experienced citizens, and then put up for public discussions. In these discussions, tens of thousands of citizens and collectives of working people usually express their thoughts and make suggestions on the submitted drafts. The criterion of this consideration in the text of the law is not determined by any balance of power and the struggle for any rival groups, but solely by the degree of their usefulness for society and each individual. And um, I want to also give one quote. I'm sorry, it's now two quotes in a row. It's a little bit much, maybe, but. Uh, one quote from the preamble of the Constitution of 1968, that, um, yeah, the Socialist Constitution. Carried out, you know, ca carried by the responsibility to show the whole German nation the way to a future of peace and socialism. In view of the historical fact that imperialism under the leadership of the USA, in agreement with circles of West German mono monopoly class, the monopoly capital, has divided Germany in order to build West Germany into a base of imperialism and of the struggle against socialism, which is contrary to the vital interests of the nation. The people of the German Democratic Republic, firmly founded on the achievements of the anti-fascist democratic and socialist upheaval and filled with the will to continue unflinchingly the path of peace, social justice, democracy, socialism and friendship among nations, has enacted this socialist constitution. Again, what what does your constitution say again? <laughs> no, it really it really gives a good idea of how very much uh, progressive politically uh, the fundament of the state was set. And it's also good to bear in mind that this constitution that has this preamble and a lot more text to it uh, was uh, voted on, discussed by the people, and actually agreed on. Uh, as their political uh, fundament. Yeah. As uh, a next <coughs> sorry, uh, example, I want to um, introduce you to the system of appeal or petition. Uh, petition. We discussed these uh, 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 words and how to translate it. Uh, it's often not too easy to actually translate the words that the GDR found for their structures or their systems and so on because uh, you do not have anything that relates to in the English language uh, because there was no socialist country <laughs> that was <laughs> speaking English. <laughs> so uh, I guess it's uh, sometimes difficult to find the right words. Uh, uh, and it's, yeah. But we translated it with a system of appeal and petition. Uh, it existed in the GDR from 1953 and uh, it's uh, been a law that enabled every citizen shall have the right to address in writing or orally proposals, indications, concerns, and complaints to the people's representatives, the state and economic management bodies, the nationally owned enterprises and combines, the socialist cooperatives and institutions, as well as to the members of parliament. Social uh, organizations also have this right. So what does it mean? If you had any problem with your flat, it was too small, if you, uh, there were problems within your workplace, if your elected representatives did not work well uh, or whatsoever, you could reach out to all the different official levels. And there was an obligation for whoever was reached out to, to uh, had that, that had to answer this appeal within four weeks. 
So in one year, um, there were about one million of these petitions. So they were really actively used by the uh, citizens. And uh, most of the appeals led to concrete changes. They were not all agreed on fully, but they had to be worked with and changes needed to be done. So, um, and also the accumulated appeals also were evaluated in the certain fields so that um, the different uh, democratic structures could actually identify reoccurring problems and shortcomings that could be acted on. And um, of course, we can write appeals and mails to government officials here, but what does that mean? Does that change anything? Will they answer you at all? Maybe to win your vote? I don't know. But mm -hmm. usually you're left uh, alone with your problems. Either you have the capacity, that means money, uh, to solve them or not. The GDR was not uh, a conflict or problem-free zone, but the state and its different structures had totally different approach to these kind of uh, problems, and they actually cared. Uh, um, in general, there was a much more open relation towards uh, between the, straight, the state structures and uh, the people compared to how we experience it uh, today in capitalist societies, in the municipal, uh, municipalities, sorry, uh, in the counties and districts, there were uh, two office days a week during which citizens uh, could reach an employee in each area of res responsibility without making an appointment. In, um, um, yeah, yeah, I'll, so I'll stop uh, there with this kind of example and go to my last example, which is also really interesting, I think. It's the societal or democratic courts. Again, difficulty to translate uh, this kind of thing. Uh, it's uh, another special field of participation and democratic decision making uh, uh, that's inside the justice system of the GDR. On the base level of the uh, juridical system existed these societal courts. They were located at the workplace uh, where they were called conflict commissions and in the residential areas in and cooperatives where they were called arbitral uh, tribunals. The members of these courts were elected by the people directly. The whole court consisted of one's peers. So the court was set up by one's colleagues or neighbors, and you actually knew the people you were judged by. Workers, teachers, scientists, craftsmen, artists practice law. In the workplace, the union instructed and qualified these courts. They also organized the elections in the neighborhoods and commissions uh, of the central uh, of the National Front were responsible to organize the formation of these social societal courts. These courts were an institution to solve conflicts and problems that occurred in a more direct, um, um, yeah, they, um, um, yeah, they they were able to solve them in a more direct and relatable way. The people, the, um, no, sorry, yeah, they were. Um, Dealing with um, yeah, they were dealing with cases of labor law, civil law, misconducts, misdemeanors, small crimes, school attendance also, and uh, for example, they uh, acted on uh, property offenses, assaults, traffic offenses, occupational health and safety violations, insult and slander, trespassing. If someone felt they were in the wrong wage category, category objected their termination was lacking work discipline or felt they were being treated, treated unfairly by a supervisor, then the conflict commission or societal courts was responsible. They also acted on the theft uh, in the workplace, damage to work property, <coughs> and uh, were responsible for uh, work accidents. Especially the conflict commissions, so the social courts in the workplace, uh, were an important part of the whole justice system. In 1985, the societal courts took on about 30% of all justice cases. So it's actually, it's, it's really an important structure. In 20% of the cases, there was at least an additional recommendation for changes to prevent such incidents in the future. If someone struggles to pay the rent, perhaps the rent is too high. If teenagers destroy property in their spare time, maybe, there's not enough to do for them. If people show lack of spirit at work, maybe the work is unsatisfying 
or one is simply not the right person for the job. So you can tell by this example that the GDR um, thought differently on crimes and the way the society could act on them. They, like, they look closely at the so social environment that helped to provoke crimes or misconduct and discuss on how to change that. Crime was not uh, seen as an individual problem, but as a result of the way society works in a whole. <coughs> oh, sorry. Ah, yeah. That's a good idea. Actually, the whole justice system is a really interesting uh, part to uh, go deeper into just shortly uh, to sh show the different crime rates from uh, GDR and West Germany. You could see that in the GDR, uh, it's yeah, crimes per 100,000 inhabitants uh, actually decreased over the time, whereas in uh, Western Germany, the crime rate increased. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, in the end, I also want to go into uh, problems and contradictions referring to the field of the democratic system. So after, uh, no, I'm not going in there right now. Um, no, actually I do. Again, to start from a quote from Walter Ulbricht. Not infrequently, however, people's proposals are met with soulless bureaucratic behavior. There's still too much commanding rebuffing, running over the mouths of others, acting opinionated and patronizing, often with the good intention of serving our state and our cause, people are being shoved in the face because they are not shown enough respect, because their opinions are not listened to, because the right tone is not found, because people are arrogant, and because uh, they wrongly believe that politeness and good manners are not compatible with socialism. But the opposite is the case. That's what Walter Ulbricht says. And what does it tell us? First of all, the political leadership knew very well about problems they faced. It also points out mm. that developing a democratic culture is a struggle and process that heavily invo involves a change in character of the ones involved. Having built up the above outlined structure and concluded the laws and values for the democratic framework of a society is already a huge step forward. However, in the end, it depends on the people giving life to these structures. I tried to point out that we need to understand socialist democracy as a process to deeply change the habits and traditions of millions of people to develop new relations between the people and their societal role, to constantly deepen their active participation and to create awareness about the whole society. And this process that started after the Second World War came to some kind of stagnation in the uh, 80s. It was not flawless before, of course, and always dependent, as I said, on the people involved. But broadly, you could experience a standstill in the last decade of the ex existence of the GDR. And in my understanding, at least, it happened for uh, different reasons. One is the difficulty to constantly revolutionize society when you have different generations with a totally different experience of socialization. You could probably dis distinguish three generations in the GDR. The generation of construction, the one educated after 1945, and the one born after 1975. Especially for the last generation that, was, that has not experienced the war and capitalism, but grew up under the socialist system, it was yeah, much more difficult to develop a strong commitment and class consciousness. The youth somewhat lost their role as a revolutionary dr driving force. But the bigger problem, from my understanding, at least came from the leading party, the Socialist Unity Party. It was a huge party uh, with over two million members. Um, and they actually... Uh, not to get me wrong, they really um, the uh, they really worked for their um, uh, societal role. Uh, I mean, they for the, the the support they had in the in the GDR was really something that uh, reflected their effort, and they actually 
yeah, the progressive uh, role. But um, not all of them, not all of these two million members were committed communists. There were careerists, dogmatics, members that just did not act as role models and could not, yeah, um, could not uh, initiate uh, the much needed vitality in democratic discussions. The open criticism and self-criticism. The party was in the end not capable to lead this constant process of deepening democratic value, uh, democratic culture. With this said, it is very important to remember the constant threat of the very hostile situation with the border uh, to the imperialist camp. The situation puts the GDR in the conference constant role uh, to find the fierce cut between those who oppose socialism and work for the capitalist camp and those who criticize socialism from a position that is not opposing socialism. That's not an easy task to do. And the West was very actively trying to influence the minds and the hearts of the people with Western television and radio, which is to be remembered all in the same language. You know, it's something, uh, it's been one country. This is a special starting condition uh, over the whole time. And um, yeah, they, with this propaganda, they try to, they actually yeah, quite effectively also um, sketched a shallow and propagandistic picture of the glowing capitalist system and the GDR had a hard time to fight this battle of ideas. In fact, the way that the West is executing color revolutions all over the world already was practiced inside the socialist camp. We talked about it a little yesterday. And um, you still had a very small a political opposition inside the GDR in the 80s. They mainly organized within the churches, the only organization in the GDR that operated formally completely independent from the rest of the societal structures. And they called themselves peace movements. And as I said yesterday already, they, many of, plenty of their leaders now are active in right-wing organizations. Um, but they did not really put a threat to the GDR. The biggest dynamic uh, that created this political crisis in the 1980s come, came from the people that uh, filled uh, permits for departure and the West, concretely West Germany, with the help of the US, directly got in and used this crisis to develop an anti-socialist sentiment. Um, of course, this last phase, as a phase, um, um, as each phase, cannot be understood by only looking at the GDR, but also at the socialist camp uh, in total we needed to look. But uh, to give to counter this picture also of the peaceful resolution uh, revolution of the GDR, I just uh, brought up a picture of uh, demonstrations that actually were, uh, yeah, going on in 1989, 1990, 1991 also of people who fought for the sovereignty of the GDR and uh, against the sellout to the West, and uh, many of them opposed uh, the coal government from the West and their policies that uh, came with uh, yeah, huge problems and impoverishments and uh, something that we might get into a little later. <laughs>